Thank you. So I'll start the uh, proceedings. Good afternoon and very warm welcome to one and all present here today to the second webinar in an eight part uh, webinar series on Amrit Grand Challenge Jan Care. Today's talk is on access to primary health care in tier two, tier three cities and rural settings. I uh, will start with Dr. Vishwanadham Dupatla, AVP IKP, who will welcome and give an introduction to AGC Jankare. Then we have Dr. Shishandu Mukherjee, Mission Director, GCE India BIRAC, who will give an overview of Jankare. Followed by we'll have uh, three experts who will talk about the challenges and gaps in healthcare access. Uh, Dr. Ashwin Naik, founder Mana Wellness. Dr. Anunay Jain, country digital health lead Japigo. Professor Rajendra Pratap Gupta, founder Health Parliament and Digital Health Academy. Followed by, we'll get a startup perspective from Mr. Arun Agarwal, founder and CEO of Janitri Innovations. We'll have a question answer session as well, post the talk. So I would request, request all the participants to type in their questions in the chat box and we will take it at the end of the talk. As a general housekeeping point, I request everybody to keep their audio and video on mute while the session is going on. I now invite uh, Dr. Vishwanathan to give welcome and introduction. Dr. Vishu, over to you. Thank you, Manish. Good afternoon to all of you. And welcome to the Amrit Grand Challenge, Jankare, Reimagining Healthcare Delivery, Touching Billion Lives, second webinar series, second in the webinar series, access to primary healthcare in type two and type three cities and rural settings. As you are aware, uh, in the Amrit Grand Challenge Jankare program, 75 innovators are being supported. So 60 in the early stage idea and testing level and 13 in the late stage, uh, which are at validation and pre-commercialization. Two are from the advanced stages, which are ready for deployment. Tender. And the solutions that are aligned with the National Digital Health Mission, mission and Ayushman Bharat will get preference. The aim of you know Jankare program is to integrate the innovators' solutions, like you know some of you have started applying, into the national digital health mission to take it to the next level. So there are six broad technology domains. While filling the application, you need to select one of these things: digital health, big data, M health, blockchain, telemedicine, AI, and ML. And there are six focus areas. Though there is a provision to select more than one, we urge you to select one of the focus area that is access to primary health solutions for improved community reach, health data collection, predictive analysis, and digital learning, solutions to enhance patient complaints, data privacy, storage, security solutions, and the data-driven modeling to enable pharma and biopharma research and development. The timelines are uh, given here. The applications are open on January 26th and they will be open until March 31st. Here I want to mention one point in the application for the early stage innovators, that is uh, the idea stage. Uh, certain fields are optional. You can fill the simple answers what you have. For the essential things, you need to have a very detailed answer as requested. By July 31st, we will be informing the shortlisted candidates for the interviews. And by August 15th, the final list will be ready. So in the Jankare program to achieve at this scale, to imagine, you imagine, you know, uh, improving the healthcare delivery system of a country like India, you need several partners. So in this program, we have several partners from the government, industry, clinical network, incubator network for helping you with funding, mentorship, clinical validation, and the hospital connect and the paid pilots, and also for the follow-on funding. As I mentioned in the first slide, the funding uh, for the Initial uh, idea stage, it is 10 lakh rupees. And for the late stage, it is 20 lakh. And for deployment stage, it is 50 lakhs. So for the solutions, uh, some of the best ones will be receiving follow-on funding through our funding network. Today's webinar is on the access to primary health care. And there are six more seminars. Please, uh, you will be receiving the same link for the, all the people who have expressed interest. And for any questions, please write to AGC Jankare at IKP Knowledge Park for partnership or any 
clarification in filling the forms. With this, I would like to thank everyone and invite Dr. Shirshendu Mukherjee to summarize about the uh, GenCare initiative. Just a line about uh, Dr. Shirshendu Mukherjee, which you all are familiar. Uh, sir has been working on the initiatives at uh, BIRAC PMU along with the Welcome Trust BMGF DBT BIRAC, where R&D solutions for the affordable health care for India and beyond. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Vishu. And uh, very good afternoon to all our participants today and our esteemed guest in the panel and today. So to start with my colleague in BIRAC, Dr. Manish, and my dear friend, Professor Rajendra Gupta, uh, Ashwin, Dr. Jain, and Arun, and my colleagues at IKP. It is indeed a privilege for me to be a part of this panel discussion. And on behalf of um, uh, you know, BIRAC, I again welcome you all. Uh, the Jankare, uh, Amrit Jankare Grand Challenge you know, uh, has been uh, a very, very attractive initiative. And as you all know, we had a Jankare Challenge 1 as well, which really with NASCOM, uh, which had really a very strong uh, you know, uh, support from the innovation community. And that has really gone out well and right now being implemented at various, state, uh, various states across India. And we are reviewing with my colleague Manish has been, and we are reviewing it uh, uh, regularly. And uh, this really has brought in a very good uh, amount of success, how innovation from really a desk moves into bench and then bench into the field. And that has really shown very good results. And we are trying to handhold innovators, to not only validate in the test beds and in the public healthcare settings, but also, you know, taking, getting it, uh, you know, anchored into the uh, state health pro procurement system, the national procurement system. So that really is the idea. Uh, the Jankare, Amrit Grand Chair, Jankare Challenge 2, uh, you know, came out from a discussion with uh, Manish, my colleague and other colleagues had with the Honorable Minister when he took the first review of BIRAC. And he was of the opinion that COVID situation uh, has in India has really brought out importance of uh, mobile health, uh, mobile health and remote healthcare delivery platforms to be encouraged. And then the idea came out that this the 75th year of our independence, BIRAC should support innovations uh, really to bring about uh, uh, innovations in digital health so that uh, we can really take innovations to a level where people sitting in the remotest corner of this country can use uh, innovation, can get the healthcare delivery, public healthcare system can address the, their uh, you know, healthcare challenges. So with that idea in mind, you know, this call was designed to identify 75 digital healthcare innovations. And as was told by Vishu, we will be talking on telemedicine, digital health, M health, big data. So I think the, the idea is to really support those innovations to take it to the level as was the, uh, the, uh, also told by Vishu that uh, solutions which enhance patient compliance, uh, access to primary healthcare on tier two, tier three cities, everything will be covered. Uh, it will be the major element of to support this innovation. And I am delighted today that you know this uh, this uh, outreach program has it will uh, will have leaders in this area. My friend and one of the you know leaders in M health, not from today, uh, Rajendra used to talk about M health. I remember ten years back also that this will be future of India. That time I didn't know much about it, but he used to really you know talk about M health and he used to lead that because we have been sitting in a couple of boards together. And he used to talk that that will be the future of this country. And really so, you know, Rajendra, thanks to you that, you know, 10 years down, that is one of the things. Um, uh, Ashwin, I had the privilege of working with me during my um, Welcome Trust days, as well as uh, in the in Indo-US uh, Science and Technology Forum as well. So I think Ashwin's uh, digital inno innovations and in especially the ambulatory ventilators was one of the things which I had worked with them very closely in. So I think, um, and Arun, we were reviewing yesterday as well, and Arun, Arun's, um, and, and Dr. Jens has one of the leads in digital health. So I think this, this uh, session today will really help the innovators in you know, um, uh, understanding the gaps and how, how this challenge can address the innovation ecosystem and how we, we can get 
you know, the ideas from our uh, learned panels today to what should be addressed and how it should be addressed and what are the gaps. So this can throw some more light on the program. So thank you once again, uh, all of you for attending. My special thanks to um, Grand Challenges India is delighted to be a part of this initiative and Bayrak, who is the platform, who's the host of it, and all our other partners, you know, the NASCOM, IT, IKP, India Innovation Fund, and um, all the other partners who have been really uh, very instrumental in making this challenge a great success. Thank you. Thank you very much. We look forward to this innovation. And as you all know, the, you know, we will be really supporting this. Bayrak supports it and not only till the innovation comes out to a level, but how to handle this innovation so that it can be scaled up, implemented, and can have a very strong exit. So that that what we look forward to. Thank you very much. Over. Um, to Dr. Ashwin Naik is founder of Mana Wellness. He's a author and entrepreneur and expert in affordable healthcare. He has been a founder of many organizations and uh, he has worked in mental health well-being and digital health innovations. He is a recipient of several awards, including the Young Global Leader of uh, World Economic Forum. Uh, Dr. Ashwin Naik, I now invite you to speak on the challenges and gaps in healthcare access and possible innovations to address these gaps. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Manish Ji. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be with uh, Dr. Mukherjee, Dr. Jain, Dr. Gupta, Professor Gupta, and uh, Mr. Arun Agarwal. I'm especially thankful to Dipanvita Madam and uh, Dr. Ambuj for uh, inviting me to this um, great uh, setting. And um, the reason I'm very excited about uh, something like this is because not only is this initiative encouraging new innovations, but also using the opportunity to bring different perspectives to them so that as they go along this journey, they can uh, refine their strategy, refine their product, refine their focus. Given that in mind, I'll take this opportunity to touch upon three things. One, from our experience, what are the key gaps that we are seeing in the healthcare ecosystem? Uh, in the context of rural and uh, semi-urban areas. The second one is what is it that we can do differently uh, given that there are so many challenges. And the third one is a couple of areas that I would encourage the individuals to look at. Sir, why should not audible, sir? No? Can you hear me now? It's very clear to us. It's clear to us, sir. Clear, sir. Okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. So uh, a little bit louder is required. All right. So, um, and you know the the one thing that I will avoid is uh, possible innovations because I think uh, my learned colleagues uh, who will follow me on this panel have much more experience and they'll talk about it. I will focus on the challenges and a couple of ways we can address them. I think it's very clear to everybody who's here that uh, the big challenge of healthcare in India is not uh, really about talent capacity or innovation, but the unequal distribution. While 70% of the population in India is living in the semi-urban rural areas, majority of our healthcare facilities are in the urban areas. Well, that's a big problem. But if you look at uh, healthcare access in these areas in isolation, uh, my view is that it's not enough to do more of the same thing. For example, to bridge the gap in the small towns, we don't need to go and build more hospitals or we don't need to replicate the urban model of healthcare. So what can we do differently? And clearly there are, there are ways in which we can leverage technology. We can also leverage uh, uh, policy interventions. And finally, I believe that there needs to be a collaborative effort to solve this problem and not in isolation by one company or one small set of innovators. So I'll talk a little bit about, you know, how can we think about this differently? Uh, we used to run hospitals in uh, semi-urban and rural areas. We have uh, nine hospitals now in Karnataka. And one of the learnings that we have had is if we have to improve the healthcare access, the first thing that we have to do is think outside the hospital. It is not enough to focus on the hospitals. 
And the reason I'm emphasizing this is most innovators focus on solving problems within the hospital. So I think majority of the innovators can do a great deal of uh, uh, service if you focus outside the hospital. So that's number one. The second one is we will never have enough doctors in this country to take care of the entire population. So the, the second segment, which we need to uh, upskill uh, to provide this access is the nursing community. So how do we focus on uh, working with the nursing community? And third is even if we have good trained nurses, well, uh, you know, well equipped um, uh, clinics and hospitals, it's impossible for us to reach every nook and corner of the country uh, with this approach. So we need to involve the community. So the three things that I want to leave you with is start with looking outside the hospital, think about how you can work with nurses and think about how you can involve the community to solve this problem of healthcare access. So let's say if I were a startup in your space, I would think about these questions very deeply in the context of my own technology. The number one question I will ask is, will my technology make our nurses more productive? Can they do more with this technology if I provide this to them? Uh, it's good to focus on the problems that the doctors are facing, but I think the large majority of the usage in the public health system will be by nurses. So can we build something which makes the nurses more productive uh, would be the number one suggestion I would have. The second one is how do we tap into this large network of uh, public health workers that we have, community health workers that we have across the world, across the country and in, in remotest part of the, uh, part of the uh, region. How do we empower them to do more than what they are doing today? And empowering them doesn't mean giving them more technology, giving them more gadgets really looking at the problems that they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis and figuring out how to make it simpler for them and also have access for them uh, to, to experts and doctors and technology whenever they need. The third piece that, that, that I would strongly uh, urge you to look at, does your technology help to educate the community? You know, while, while most of our focus is in solving problems on the healthcare side, a large piece of the gap is also on community education about health and risks and behavior change, et cetera. So does your product focus on educating the community? So as you go about building your uh, innovations, I would look at these three areas. Uh, is it making our nurses more productive? Is it making our community health workers more empowered? And is it making our community more educated about health? So these are the three main areas I would focus um, to address the gap in the healthcare access in these smaller towns. So with that, I, I, I want to summarize you know, some of the things that uh, I touched upon, but leave you with the thought that when you, when you look at innovation, when you look at gaps, just don't look at the gaps in the hospital or healthcare setting but also look at how the technology can help people who are actually delivering healthcare in these regions and empower them, educate them and make them more productive. So I think that's when we can solve this access gap, uh, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is prevalent across the country. And hopefully all of you will make a big difference uh, to, to, to the healthcare of the country. Thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Manish. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, definitely the audience today would have understood different areas where the innovation should be focused. Not only that, they will understand the innovations uh, that uh, is the need of the R as well. Now with that, uh, an ecosystem, a robust ecosystem can be built. That again uh, is something that we have to see, integrating different kinds of solutions. And for that, uh, I'm very thankful to you. And for the next round, I invite uh, Dr. Anunaya Jain. Uh, I'll uh, give a short introduction about him. Uh, so Dr. Anunaya Jain is a country digital health lead, Jepego. Uh, he is a physician and MBA with over 15 years of experience. He has worked with various 
organizations in progressive leadership roles and has created governance structure for large scale production. He has led the digital health initiatives across national health programs and with various state and central governments. He has, is also a well, very well cited academic author with over 100 publications. I now hand it over to Dr. Anunya Jain for his talk. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Manish. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, appreciate the introduction. And uh, Dr. Nayak, thank you for setting the stage uh, so very well uh, for this particular conversation. Um, uh, you know, I, I'd love to thank Dr. Amboj and IKP for giving the platform and to the co-panelists who have agreed to mentor and offer their support to all of these organizations that are part of the Amrit Challenge itself. Um, I wanted to start a little bit off with a quick introduction of Jafaigo itself. Uh, uh, we're a not-for-profit organization um, that is focused across the globe. Uh, today, we work across 40-plus uh, countries, um, across 140-odd projects. Um, in India, we've been working for the last couple of decades and focused our attention on a variety of primary healthcare needs, family planning needs, maternal and child health needs, um, needs of the youth as far as their healthcare is concerned, and more recently getting involved with the COVID-19 response as well. Um, I wanted to start the chat off with making sure that we all fundamentally agree on this statement, right? That we happen to be a country that's steeped in culture where prayer and God and, um, and, and customs are equally as important as the necessity in order to adapt to digital ecosystems is concerned. Um, you know, throughout my trips and my visits across rural India at this point of time, a fundamental reality is that the digital divide is continuing to end. And therefore, the time is absolutely ripe for the creation of a digital health ecosystem that enables the delivery of care. At Japaiko, at least at this point of time, we recognize that there are basic gaps that are present in the healthcare system. And as Dr. Nayak rightly outlined, all of our interventions are focused on addressing each one of these gaps. Currently, we work on addressing four areas. Um, and so for the purposes of this talk, I will leave each one of these four areas aside and focus on other needs, right? Um, the first is the universal availability, as, at least as far as digital applications is concerned, in order to establish a digital continuum of data um, across individual patients and clients. The second one is ensuring that with these applications themselves or with these health models themselves, they actually are established and steeped within the workflows of the individual healthcare providers that they can be used by beneficiaries that they're targeted to. And there's enough capacity that is being built in the system in order to address that. The third one is obviously because there is this diversity in applications, you need data to start flowing from each other. And ABDM uh, and the government has been playing a massive role in trying to enable this, but there is still a lot that needs to be done in order to ensure interoperability and integration between applications to really ensure that data can talk to each other. And the last one is that because now you've invested so much in having good data with you, um, in having longitudinal data with you, can we start using this data in order to make decisions using advanced analytics to derive prediction support, et cetera. This, these are the four areas that we've been working on. But today I want to focus on making sure that we look at the ecosystem in a slightly different fashion, right? If you look at the healthcare system today, right, it's easy for us to divide it into three distinct aspects. There is the demand side of the equation, which effectively is everything to do with clients, beneficiaries, patients that exist in the market. There is the supply side of the equation that has everything to do with the providers, the healthcare facilities, um, and the allied healthcare providers, including the informal sector. Delivery. In between sits the actual delivery of the care itself, and it, all of this is surrounded in an ecosystem. If you were to look at the history of innovations and interventions that has happened to this day, a lot has been done in order to support the delivery of the specific service type itself. Right? So a lot of attention has gone into making sure that the delivery of service can be augmented in that. Some amount of work has started happening as far as the healthcare provider is concerned, which is where a lot of our interventions today are getting focused. A lot needs to be done as far as the demand side equation is concerned, because there isn't just the recognition of the need at this point of time, right? And so for, the, for, for 
the next few minutes, I'll talk a little bit more on each one of these aspects. So we'll start with the demand side of the equation, right? Where are we seeing as far as Jafaigo is concerned are the needs within this sector? There are two primary needs that are, in, that are emerging right at the upfront, right? Especially as it relates to tier two, tier three cities, rural India itself, right? There is an immense need for information that is there. Whether it is to do with grounds level foundational information that relates to education of the patients and health literacy of the patients, to the delivery of targeted alerts and targeted information to patients, especially as it relates to conditions that they have or high risks that they are likely to develop, to the information that patients can consume on demand when and where they want. Right? I think this gap that exists today as far as the literacy divide is concerned needs definite support as far as innovations is concerned in order to ensure that health information can be provided to these beneficiaries as and when they require. The next one is this, once you have information, once you have knowledge that is imparted to you, then there is the obvious need for self-care that comes in and taking self-agency, if I may use that word, for your own healthcare decisions themselves. This could include things such as wearables, this could include things such as technologies that allow users to be able to track their healthcare itself. Thus far, all of this has remained in the hands of the elite, in the hands of the few, um, but now it's time that it starts entering into the public healthcare stream itself. At the same point of time, there is an immense need that we see in, the, in the, this domain for peer-to-peer -peer networks to be created as well. How does a patient group start to get connected to another patient group? And this then starts crossing geographic boundaries. Today, day and age, as you go, and we've tried this model in a couple of places where a group antenatal care checkup has shown benefit for a large number of beneficiaries. But given COVID, all of that came to a stop because suddenly you weren't allowed physical contact with another. Suddenly you weren't able to congregate populations and target groups together. And yet there is this need for a, a network. All of us live in a digital network connected age. And so why not do that for our patients as well? The last part of it is financial tools themselves. There is a huge area of opportunity that we certainly foresee as far as enabling patients with fintech solutions in order to be able to better judge decisions for their care and enable to better manage their care as well. So on the demand side of things, those are effectively the five things that we definitely see. Coming to the supply side of the equation, we see a lot of need for robust resource planning. At this point of time, resource planning is more or less done either on whims and fancies or on the basis of preliminary data that exists. However, how do you make this more robust? How do you make sure that in a digital day where data is available, that we leverage this data to the max in order to make these decisions in a lot better fashion? At the same point of time, communication has started to show up its realm. Today, when we go and talk to physicians and we talk to healthcare providers, they often communicate with each other or with their patients over WhatsApp, right? Now, this is exactly where most organized countries were 20 years back, where non-secure methodologies of communication were, were the fall. But it's time now where we start understanding that patient-protected healthcare information is is the game, right? And so we need to start protecting it. So how do you create secure mechanisms of communication, whether it is from one healthcare provider to the other or between a healthcare provider and the patient itself? And so the communication tools start becoming more and more important. It's also important to start thinking of it in terms of synchronous communication as well as asynchronous communication, because both aspects are important when you're starting to talk about an interaction of the healthcare system with effective beneficiaries themselves. In order to adapt to all of these digital tools themselves, we certainly see that there is a lack of an efficient system that comprises and that enables digital capacity building between uh, for these healthcare providers. And so we certainly see a large room of opportunity exists as far as digital capacity building initiatives is concerned and trying out varied methodologies as far as extended reality simulations are concerned in order to impart not just cognitive, but also skill-based learning to these providers themselves. 
Intelligent referrals is again something that we've been speaking of. There's a lot of work that has been done as far as identification of high risk uh, patients is concerned. And yet a very little amount has happened in order to bring the entire ecosystem together in order to ensure that the patient can reach the right place at the right time. And so how do you start to consume a lot of the information that exists readily available at this point of time in order to create mechanisms that enable intelligent referrals and such? And the last part is risk management itself. How do you enable providers to be able to judge the risk up front and to be able to manage that risk as well? Whether it is through the use of AI ML models that predict the risk, I think the next step needs to be taken now where you have these risk models that are predicting risk of certain disease, but how do you now manage this patient in order to negate that risk itself? And then in turn, start training your AI and ML models. Of it again. The last part of the story is far, as far as the ecosystem is concerned, and there are certain interventions and innovations that still um, are the need of the art. The first one is population data management. Right? At least at this point of time, there is a lot of individual data management that is starting to happen. But how do you now start aggregating that across entire populations in order to be able to make sure that decisions across groups of communities can be made? How do you manage human resource scheduling? This is the bane of the existence of the public healthcare system as it exists today. Right? And so how do I make sure that the most resources are available at the places and at the time where the need is the highest? And I think um, the solution to that could turn to be a game changer for the delivery of care itself. Performance measurement continues to happen. It happens in an ad hoc fashion. What we need is more intelligent mechanisms in order to be able to judge performance of facilities of processes of care. Counterfeit identification and equipment assessment and monitoring, I think there, there is a strong need for us to be able to take this away from human hands and transition it into automated hands so that this can happen at scale. These are fundamentally needs that we at least foresee as far as the healthcare ecosystem and a digitally enabled healthcare ecosystem is concerned today. But there's obviously a step into the future as well. And so what do we foresee as the future of healthcare as far as an ecosystem across India is concerned? We certainly see that there is a move that will happen in this healthcare ecosystem to move from the equity access um, components towards the more precision health components themselves, right? And towards the more precision health components, not just from an individual perspective, but from an entire population perspective. What we foresee is a move to definite precision public health. To those of you who are not quite aware of this term, precision public health is a way of targeting interventions across entire populations, right? Identifying which of these populations are at risk and then managing that risk in order to improve the overall outcomes of the population themselves. And I think from a national perspective or from a state perspective, this is perhaps what is going to be the most important aspect that will help us achieve this, the sustainable development goals by 2030. So to say. There are four needs that we certainly see in this move to precision health. One is how can we enhance the speed of data availability? Second, how can we start bringing in newer forms of data other than the existing clinical information that includes socioeconomic and cultural data, geospatial data, omics data themselves to incorporate that into the way that data is looked at today? How do we start bringing in more AI and ML into the picture as far as disparate data analysis is concerned? Right now, we're focusing on single data systems and single data generations in order to predict risk but how can we now start doing this across a variety of disparate data itself? And then the last part of it is how can we really enhance the precision of understanding of our healthcare delivery and healthcare outcomes across entire populations themselves? We certainly see that this is the crux of how we will be able to save lives and improve health to transform the future of healthcare. Thanks, Manish. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You have crisply covered uh, each and every component of the ecosystem, and I'm sure that the audience would have understood what all they can uh, work on, where all the innovations can come, and where all the need 
is there so that they can address. Uh, we have discussed the innovations. We have discussed about the ecosystem, and all of that gets driven by policy. So, for the talk, uh, taking this talk to the next stage, where I would like to invite Professor Rajendra Pratap Gupta to give a little uh, introduction. Although he doesn't need any introduction, uh, he is a public policy expert. founder of health parliament and digital health academy uh, and uh, he he has been associated with several foundations organizations and initiatives he has been uh, advising to indian government international governments and many organization including the un the unesco the world bank the who etc uh, he has been awarded and nominated for he has been awarded for several awards as well as was um, nominated to world economic forum uh, for global agenda council i now hand over to professor rajendra prasad gupta to give his talk sir over to you thank you so much and uh, really appreciate your inviting me to this forum uh, manish and i think it's a great moment for the country for this jan care and the fact that you know we are going to look at 75 disruptors i would call them whom we you know nothing nothing to worry because uh, at the end of it we have to still rely that despite all the technology human intervention will be required so uh, let's carry on and i am more excited the, to the fact you know that ikp and bayrak are leading this i had a good fortune to work with dr shishendu mukherjee and dr dipanvita who are i think among the top leaders in this domain you know and over a decade so that also uh, gives me a uh, more excitement for the jan care reaching to the level that was envisioned uh, so uh, the way i look at reimagining healthcare is very different you know we all look at healthcare from the siloed perspective like what can change so i was thinking okay what do i share with the people who are looking at being applying for the startup program so if i were to just overly put to you How, what is what is the future you know how do we remanage in healthcare so anything you can look at health or touch in health needs transformation there is nothing that doesn't need a transformation all of it needs transformation end to end that's one second covid has bared the reality of the fractured health systems it has also led india to be one of the largest producers of so we called ppe kits and other things that we needed so it, it triggered in us an opportunity to show to the world that we can develop things that the world needs so i think from me from my side anything that you can imagine in healthcare needs to be transformed i think yesterday i put out some stats about indian healthcare on my twitter and linkedin so i'm not going to repeat that but as a startup i need to share certain things because i had also an opportunity to be on the other side of corporate world and as startups so you need a value proposition you need a business model if you are applying for this program and most importantly when we look at this particular program so you need to have a value proposition a business model that mostly you will be bootstrap if you are applying so for me business intelligence comes before artificial intelligence so make sure that you have that business intelligence and i think there are a lot of programs that byrack runs at least i know that and i'm sure ikp do you know which provides a lot of inputs and i think they're on a weekly show as well i'm sure someone is going to talk about that too whether you are funded or not you can still leverage that opportunity and you know learn about startups so when you look at startups when you look at healthcare as a uh, i'll say as a domain there are two ways you can approach it one look and look at from a market standpoint other is you can look from a population standpoint both the numbers run in billions so if you look at healthcare as a market you can take anywhere a health indian healthcare market between 250 billion to 372 billion whichever number you believe but it's a huge market essence is that if you look from a population standpoint of course 1.39 billion people and almost 600 million medical conditions you know in terms of the chronic comorbidities that we have but yes if you're a startup you have to understand one thing indians are real value driven they drive you crazy in terms of value and i have one number to substantiate that part we have 800 million to whom people our government is actually providing free ration so that should give you a sense of when you work on innovation do not go over excited on pricing you have to be very realistic and that's where innovation comes in now from a patient and disease spread 
there is no difference between rural and urban areas i thought i would make my points as points and you got to read between them and make business sense out of that and each of these points have a business opportunity so there is no difference today between rural and urban in terms of the prevalence or whatever diseases or medical conditions you say the challenge healthcare faces is we are asset heavy we are really you know on models which are unsustainable so disruptors like you as startups will have to look at them from becoming aggregator or asset light or low freeze because like it or not we have moved towards an insurance model we have the world's largest insurance scheme and funded by the government so suddenly we will talk about outcome based healthcare if not now i think the health policy clearly outlines that or what we are going to look at i think all innovators who are looking at client should read the 36 page health policy is a short one but it outlines the agenda of the government and that is what the government has been implementing through various program in terms of a business opportunity healthcare today is reactive from the care seekers point of view from care providers point of view you don't get what's needed you don't get the appropriate care and trust is fast eroding and all of these are also opportunities if you are a startup and also healthcare is driven overly by doctors and i say this that we need doctors we know that but technology is a great leveler and i think if you are a startup in digital domain you would realize that before anyone else and if you look at the case load scenario this is a very interesting opportunity that comes to all of us 10 to 15% of the population suffers from mental health issues and we have only 6000 psychiatrists just amount the amount of load that people have and most of the psychiatrists are in metros just think about the opportunity that you can plug as a gap so we have a national mental health health program announced in the budget but there'll be more opportunities coming the way look at cancer we have 2.4 million cancer patients at any point in time and we have only 500 medical oncologist that's another big opportunity we have 30 million heart patients we have 4000 cardiologists we need 88000 so again you look at the gaps and when people use two words together digital divide i think that is itself a business opportunity because digital and divide should not go together when there is digital there should be no divide and that that is going to be i think addressed by entrepreneurs which are going to be supported by byrac and ikb above all what i see as a big uh, challenge you know being in healthcare and being in it working at the government level ever in the past despite all we have we still have patients who come and say i need to go to aims i need to go to tata memorial i need to go to kidwai i need to go to nimhans or pgi there should be solutions where we filter and serve these people in the places where they are seeking care and they should not be referred to the so called national level center so i think there is a great opportunity out there it is not that those tertiary care institutions need technology the places and the people whom they serve they should be served in the places they are coming from that's one so between august and october last year at health parliament we ran series of master classes we got world top leaders we posed to it the challenges we have and we looked at what are the solutions so three messages came out very succinctly and they have a great Uh, business opportunities first thing for primary care the focus that we have for this particular uh, workshop or webinar so primary care is moving beyond doctors that's a fact in fact one of the tallest leaders uh, in the world who was involved in many reports including with eric topol made this point that intelligent ehrs could do a whole, whole lot more than primary care doctors that's one point secondary and tertiary care moves beyond the beds so that's another major opportunity how do you deliver care beyond the beds and if you provide pri proper primary care secondary and tertiary care gets addressed to a large extent at a very early entry level and the third is management of chronic diseases move beyond the pills and why this is very important is you got to understand that the role of provider payers and regulators are going for a big change and i will give you two examples and this will give you a sense of how fast healthcare has uh, i think disrupted itself so software is prescribed like a drug in the united states and germany which was not the case it is provided and reimbursed like a drug by insurers and there's a very interesting thing in 2018 
WHO classified gaming as a disorder. In 2020, US FDA used gaming for treating a disorder, ADHD. So that's the disruption that's happening in healthcare. I think this is this is when India has still not up the ante. I think when you when you all start using this Jan Care scheme and uh, you know build up newer solutions, we will disrupt it more. So the future of healthcare, as I see, is has to be reimagined from your eyes as an entrepreneur and not from people like me who carry a huge baggage. I've written an exhaustive book on digital health which is like a 600 pager it talks about a whole lot of things from all 31 specialties of what's going to get disrupted to uh, you know the professions that are going to get disrupted so i'm not going to deal much on that i'm going to be really brief so that we can take more questions and answers so what i see as disruptions coming in if you really look at primary care is we need to be proactive we need to be integrated we need to be predictive and we need to move towards precision medicine and aggregated models with point of care diagnostics so in a sense, if you ask me what's what's reimagining healthcare, everything that you and I see, we've got to get and disrupt it. And this program allows you to do that. This will fund you right from an idea to a pre-launch to a launch phase. So this, I think, is a fantastic opportunity. I, in fact, learn, looking forward to learning the innovations that come through it. And thanks for giving me an opportunity to put my views across. Over to you, Manish. Thank you very much, sir, for your spellbound talk. Uh, definitely the disruptors have a lot to unpack uh, to find uh, the solutions that are asset light as well as um, how they can um, actually address these, uh, these solutions. Um, and with that, I will move to the to, to uh, Mr. Uh, Arun Agarwal. Uh, I'll present a small brief about him. Uh, he is a founder and CEO of Janetri Innovations. He himself is a biomedical engineer who founded Genetri with the aim that there should not be any mortality uh, uh, during pregnancy or delivery or post delivery. Uh, he has developed innovated new age fetal maternal monitoring system, KR and Daksh. And uh, just to understand the startup perspective of access to healthcare, I hand over to Mr. Arun Agarwal to give his talk. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Manish. <clears throat> I would actually thanks to Bayrak, IKP and all the stakeholders. And it is my pleasure to present my story here, like what exactly happened in the last five, six years. And I come from the innovator background. So <clears throat> uh, I have really learned a lot from the people who have already speak and are always looking forward to learn from them. But <clears throat> What really, I, I could only share what exactly really matters a lot when you are in a phase of uh, finding a problem, when you're in a phase of building a solution, when you're in a phase of deployment, scale up. And this is what I could learn from a lot of people in this ecosystem, either from the BioVac or Japaigo or IKP. Uh, this is something what I could share. So <clears throat> my journey actually started where Bayrak actually have supported and I think this is part of this program as well where when you are actually in a phase of an idea uh, what really matters a lot how extensively you are validating that idea that means forget about the solution but are you sure that that problem really exists and for that what really matters is if you are spending time with the stakeholders who are going to use this solution or who are facing that problem and stakeholder are multiple the stakeholders if i talk about healthcare then it is <clears throat> uh, healthcare professionals doctors staff nurse midwife ashas it is government stakeholders who are is officer who are running the program it is the foundation uh, who are helping government in running their program like uh, gates foundation japai go UNICEF, it is stakeholder who are making the program. So I think that conversation really matters a lot at the very, very early stage when you are validating the problem statement. And I always say to everyone, uh, even based on my learning that if you have one hour uh, to solve a problem or to build something on a problem, then try to spend 55 minutes on the problem validation and then five minutes in developing the solution. And that is how my journey started where I spent almost one, one and a half year in identifying the problem and 
validating the problem where i have spent time with the stakeholder so at janitri we are into maternal and child healthcare so i got a chance to spend a lot of time with the gynecologist pediatrician staff nurses midwife took a lot of interviews spent my lot of time day and night saw live delivery saw c section and that gave me a good perspective on what's happening in this whole phase of journey it is about the phase what kind of existing products are available what are the existing government scheme what are the other foundations who are helping in actually supporting reducing the maternal mortality rate and infant mortality rate and that itself support given by bayrac uh, you could understand that you even do not have an idea and somebody is supporting you you know to you go out and find the problem and then build on a solution so that is really important when you even define your solution when you even define your problem statement now here <clears throat> what really important is when you are going to do that this this partnership really matters a lot for example you are spending a time with the hospital that means that hospital is actually interested it could be a government hospital or a private hospital or some some other organization is really interested in giving you a time to so you can spend time with their healthcare professional or their their body that means they are really respecting you what you are doing because those really become your early test bed as soon as you are actually going to develop a solution then you actually have to again test the product in some facility or some kind of a setting and uh, those are the partner then who are going to support you further and further they will become your customer because because they believe in you and then with them you have validated the problem statement they have tested your product and further they want to scale up your product so this is this is the journey which you should always look for look for uh, the collaboration with the partner since beginning whether if if even if you do not have a solution in your hand even if you are developing the even if you are validating the problem statement now <clears throat> uh if if i if i should divide this journey uh one is the validation which you can spend a lot of time at there could be a multiple way there could be an interview which you can take there could be a shadow process you can actually shadow the whole healthcare professional let's suppose a staff nurse in your domain for example in our domain it is a staff nurse who is actually doing monitoring of a pregnant woman and who is actually delivering a pregnant right pregnancy so we did i did shadow them what exactly they are doing what kind of a monitoring they are doing why the baby is still giving uh, a still birth so that that data is really important further the geography also matters a lot if you look at india india is really large and uh, every geography has a different different problem different different kind of a problem statement so you should always consider a travel to the different domain so you could consider north east west south try to visit primary secondary tertiary both in public and private to actually understand what's happening in this whole phase to actually understand the problem statement further <clears throat> it comes to about product development journey and that really matters a lot in the medical device or health tech because uh, you have to go you, you need an expert so all think advisors and mentors really matters a lot where you can have a collaboration with an expertise to develop this product because of the early funding constraint you really cannot hire a very highly skilled or highly experienced people so that mentors and advisors you need it but at the same time the collaboration with the hospital or with the any organization for your product validation clinical trial is important because data is important so you should actually identify a i i could say a principal investigator or a doctor relevant to your field who really believe in you as a person and also in the problem statement who is going to definitely help you in testing the product validating the product at multiple center if data is needed a lot because and that that could be your medical advisors as well in the, in the long term journey and you should have those multiple people multiple doctors in this whole phase because this testing the product ये सगा दर्द तो तू है केंडा मेडा हूं अच्छा बेटा टेस्टिंग इज नॉट 
at a different facility with the help of a principal investigator who is actually who is actually interested in your idea is going to take you to the next level where you want to deploy these product in the primary healthcare second tertiary healthcare second settings or or secondary healthcare settings specifically in government and private sector hence the organizations like uh, here anumya is here and and we have been working together now japaigo uh, the organization like wish foundation uh, the organizations like unicef who who are already working with the government and supporting their program uh, is really going to help you a lot if you start working with them since beginning because they know what is happening on field they have an operations on field they know uh what exactly the priorities of government in terms of uh what exactly they want to deploy on field in priority what kind of a budgets are available because as a startup when you are going to develop a product you are definitely going to see the business model that who is going to procure it and that means you have to really identify when you want to scale up in government setting whether it is a priority of government whether the state have some kind of a funding available or not whether that uh any any kind of a foundation is working with the state on the similar kind of a program so that is something uh, you should consider from beginning itself and now it comes to uh you know reiteration of a product which is important because nothing nothing comes ideal in a single shot and you have to keep iterating the product in this journey based on these factors based on these stakeholders what they are providing based on these validation clinical trial which you are doing and keep incorporating that feedback into your product uh, so you will keep deploying that and you will keep innovating that 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 also uh, matters a lot now it comes when it comes to a national program uh, and and you know that in india health is a state subject uh, so every state uh, they have different sort of a priority based on the state and different geography that is where you need to identify what exactly that state priorities are and you need to do an early pilot which this janker program will definitely help you because we are one of the winner uh, of the last year of the janker program and uh, they actually have uh, introduced us to the states and we have deployed our product and we are directly working with the state health department to seek to actually prove this is how it will work so they can consider that into their uh, long term journey and deploying in all other settings so early pilot with the state is something you should consider when when you are actually have the product and you you think that you can deploy with the states uh, one of the learning i i could say in last couple of year is uh, because as a as a medtech founder or as a as a health tech startup you will have a very limited bandwidth and the key is the collaboration you 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 can definitely work on the product uh, the innovation on the on innovation side of it but when it comes to let's suppose clinical validation when it comes to deployment you should always consider a partner uh, who having the expertise towards it and you can actually focus on technology you can focus on building more innovation you can focus more on ip but when it comes to the large deployment always consider uh, a partner who who already have the presence on field uh, that's going to be a quick scale up uh, for you so so at janitri we uh, have seen this journey and we are we still consider ourselves in a very early phase uh, where we have started now scaling up in a very slowly manner but that has been supported in the very early stages by byrac in multiple phases whether it is whether it is a product validation or problem validation phase to a product a clinical validation phase and further to a scale up phase and then uh, supported by ikp in the multiple phases as well and uh, <clears throat> chepaigo uh, now we are also trying to have a uh, partnership with them to see how this product can actually leverage uh, other thing what we have learned because health system is healthcare system is really really big and you might be working on one of the problem statement one of the small problem statement from this whole umbrella 
So always think about the integration of product. The data should speak with the other system. So, so do not really think that I should keep the data with myself. So always think about can can my data can speak with any other healthcare software which is the available uh, by the government by the state health department uh, because that is how it will give you the visibility and that is how you can scale up with the uh, healthcare system. Uh, that is one of the uh, learning which we all see we we already have in last couple of year. Uh, but I would, you know, lastly, I would just want to say that uh, focus in the very early stage, just try to focus more on the problem validation and try to understand the whole ecosystem. Talk with each and every stakeholder who is into that particular uh, field or area, which can give you the more information on your problem. So you will be able to develop a better solution considering all those stakeholders in your mind. So this is something what uh, I would like to say and but this is a very crux of last uh, five, six year of journey and uh, happy to connect with anyone in future. If you uh, need uh, any other sort of uh, learning from me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Manish. Thank you, Mr. Arun, for giving your perspective from a startup point of view. Uh, Dr. Vishu, over to you. Thank you, Arun. Thank you, Vishu. And uh, thank you very much for acknowledging and you know uh, sharing your experience and especially for the support you received at the early stage. And I think uh, everybody here uh, working with the Life Science Innovation knows the support uh, the BIRAC offers, especially for the early stage, be it uh, DOZI, PZ, LOZI.AI, BrainSight. So some of these, you know, very early stage uh, student-led companies are working with the governments. So as you mentioned very clearly, the collaboration is the key. Startup by themselves may not be able to do. And in the GenCare program, there is a very special component where we have just mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, solutions aligned with National Digital Health Mission will be given priority. So please uh, take note of the points mentioned by Arun. And thank you so much, uh, Arun, for sharing all the details. Now, uh, the session is open to Q&A. So we will start with the first question, actually a very interesting uh, question. <clears throat> with the nuclear family trend uh, setting up in the country, senior citizens, including my parents, are in a tier three city. Uh, how do you think that these innovators can help? Actually, you know, this is a problem statement for some of you. Uh, please take a note and I request uh, one of the speaker to uh, take lead and answer. Sir, please. Okay, so I'll take that if, if, if everyone's okay. I think please. the fundamentals still stay the same, right? Um, what are you really looking at achieving with care of each one of these, these groups of people, right? Um, the three delays still apply, whether it is in the delay to decision making, whether it is in the delay to seeking care, or whether it is in the delay to getting the right care made available to them. I think that those three fundamentals still apply. Um, the fundamental need for ensuring that they flow into a continuum of care still applies. Um, the fundamental that they continue their care or, or the continuity of their care is maintained still applies, right? And so I think whether you look at those problems from a specific target group perspective or not, I, I think it's important to stick to the fundamentals. Um, your service offering might start becoming different as you start segmenting your target population into who your target clients are. And uh, the, the, the important thing to remember is, especially for startups that are going to look at this as a financial enterprise, um, is who is your client and who is your consumer? And there is a difference between the two, right? Um, there is somebody who's going to pay for the service and there's going to be somebody who's going to consume the output of the service itself, right? So as you remember these, these aspects, um, I think you could still ensure that you address the fundamentals and your service offering would, would eventually be. Thank you, sir. Professor Rajendra. Thank you. Thank you, Vishu. And I think this is a very important question and also the fact that we have 140 million senior citizens. So in one of the uh, discussions I was having with leaders of what, what's the future, I think 86% of all senior citizens take one medication or the other and there are comorbidities in that. And 
you need to understand one thing and this is one segment that's going to grow phenomenally by 2000 we have done some of the estimates for some other projects one out of five will be a senior citizen we all probably will be in that league so i think you need to look at the entire continuum of care and start putting models in care i think you have put that you know world is moving towards nuclear families we in india are doing that so people want to take care of their parents or elderly and pay for it so right from the care homes to care at home these two extreme are a huge opportunity plus there are a lot of things that can monitor the progression of disease and management of disease so i think there are multiple opportunities that come in the domain itself and that's that's phenomenal that's phenomenal i mean you need to look at not a problem statement but an opportunity statement i mean i say you know everything is an opportunity and a massive one and i think you are all disrupted i believe so remember one thing if we have to manage healthcare in india we are a lower middle income country for us spending 20 percent of the gdp is pretty okay not for us and 85 percent of all expenses of the us going people with chronic diseases we can't afford that so you got to look at senior citizen people who are already in and people who will be getting into that in 10 15 years so you got to look at saying hey look there are solutions which are like as i said software as a drug software is also a medical device software is more than just software so i think you can look at providing multiple opportunities for healthcare for people progressing into senior citizens and middle age i see is phenomenal opportunity and i hope that you know when the call for proposals uh, close we would have multiple uh, players into this domain itself okay so uh, moving to the next question uh, this is uh, more about uh, eligibility technical eligibility kind of thing uh, whether individuals can apply for the grant uh, as discussed yes certainly for the early stage idea and testing the initial grant uh, certainly individuals academic people all innovators can apply only for the late and advanced stage uh, smes and companies can apply. maybe again this question is for professor rajinder sir uh, government of india regulations for management managing the patient peer group uh, with reference to the hipaa complaints where is the resource we should go to so i think there are a lot of resources now put on the uh, nha website there are a lot of discussions paper which are already one of them is already in the public domain and we are we are doing a scoping exercise with nha on digital health and very happy to you know take this offline to know what exactly are you looking at and what would be the scope of your response but i think this is still as you know digital is evolving field we are all working on trying to see the entire gamut and you know plug get it plugged so there are a lot of resources there on the bureau of indian standards if you really look at there is a msp committee number 17 that has produced a lot of reports over the last few years on compliances and standards uh there are at nabh though not public as of now uh and in the nha website there are a lot of resources made available and even you can look at uh, the uh, niti io on the ai part thank you very much sir and next question maybe arun can step in to answer so this is mainly regarding uh, how to identify and validate the problems uh, related to the chronic therapy for the rural and type 3 cities what kind of opportunities exist for the startups the problem validation uh, again the collaboration is the key and that is where the uh, the collaboration with ikp the collaboration with bayrak comes into picture and those connects really uh, matters a lot for us this is how it helps when we when we were doing the problem validation uh, personally i did not know uh, whom where to go and that is where the uh, introduction had been started happening where i started spending time with the hospital setting whether it's a government private foundation trust so i think this program will definitely help you in those introduction and for where you can actually spend good amount of time for the problem validation uh, irrespective of the field thank you arun and the next question is a uh, general one uh, whether there is any preference for solutions with the device or with the platform <clears throat> here the focus areas are more important than your product so please uh, focus at the problem areas you are addressing rather than your product or platform both are equally preferred So my project is in the initial stage to connect hospitals of remote remote locations of cities for cerebral palsy and unconscious patients. However, the budget is higher than the limit. 
Uh, okay, so uh, budget related questions, uh, you know, as uh, in the previous seminar, uh, Deepanvita Madam mentioned, for good solutions, follow on funding and support from additional resources is always in pipeline. But uh, I would like to request the speaker to uh, one of the speakers to address this. Uh, Dr. Naik, one of the innovators is working on connecting the hospital, uh, remote hospitals for cerebral pal palsy and unconscious uh, patients. So, Vishu, I'll take to respond on this. So, when sure, you, are, you are connecting hospitals, so let's also understand the scope of your project. So, if you're just merely connecting, uh, a GIS mapping and you know an app to connect would be just enough. If you're looking at connecting for teleconsultations, and I think then there is an e Sanjeevni that's available, and there are more. So you you got to be clear about, as I said, the, what's the value proposition and what's the value. So you got to look at addressing that part. So it, I'm not able to get from you. Are you just merely looking at becoming a laundry list of all the providers, or are you looking at providing consultations? So both are doable. And uh, I think, as rightly my previous speaker told me, uh, told you that you know the incubators plus funders like IKP or even Bayrak have phenomenal networks. I think there is no other organization I know of in the country who can give you the networks to make sure that even in the grant that you get or the fund that you get, you can still deliver it. But you have to be clear about what's the framework you're looking at. That's that is what I would say here. Uh, if I may please clarify the. If I may please clarify my vision. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I have a vision to connect the cerebral palsy and unconscious patients with real-time data. Because at many remote locations, the doctors are insufficient or the staff is not adequate. So the data, critical data may be sent to the specialized hospitals or the group of doctors so that they can immediately take care of those things. And that will be a real time low cost data. Okay, so uh, this one you got to look at it because it's about data sharing. Again, you know, when you look at problem in, in the startup stage, it's more like a PhD, you need to be very specific. So when you look at data sharing, what exactly is the data you're looking at? If you're talking about patient data, a lot of things have to be looked at around it. So maybe, you know, happy to do a one on one call, but uh, you will have to look at it if I get it right. If it is data sharing, I think it's just more than what you're looking at doing right now. So, uh, ECG and EEG data, the data is specifically ECG and EEG data. So, so you mean to say that, sorry for, you know, when trying this more. So you're looking at getting the patient's data and connected to hospital to seek consultation or what? No, sir. For the uh, predictive control, we are using the cognitive science for the predictive control. But mm -hmm. since the patients are unconscious or of cerebral palsy before proceeding for any control mechanism, you would like the doctor to go give the go-ahead. Because in many cases, uh, even for cerebral palsy, uh, these bed sores are one of the common problems. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to design, we are in the initial phase of designing the bed as well as taking the data and making a cognitive study of those data. And based on the data, we'll be changing the posture of the patient so that he or she doesn't get the bad source and furthermore, there are more applications for this. But before that, we want the doctor to give a go ahead. That's the thing. So I'm sorry, I'm asking you more questions. So you want to first get anonymized data or it is specific patient data that you will share? Uh, we'll be sharing the anonymous data and based on the data from different patients, if a patient is requiring some immediate attention, then the data will be immediately reflected to the doctor so either uh, it may be an SMS or it can be other formats of the alerts and the doctor would be required to give the immediate attention whether we shall be go going ahead with the suggested solutions by the computer or not. Because the solutions will be interpreted by us, it will be analyzed through the cognitive science and given to the doctors the various solutions which we feel according to the computation. Have you have you created a use case out of it? Can you, you know, uh, share that? Uh, so to an extent, we have the... Uh, ECG data with us currently and we are in the cognitive study phase and uh, fuzzy classification phase as well. Once the classification is done, then we have a number of solutions that we'll be working on in the next two months. Okay, okay.
so i cannot envision right now you know unless i see it little in more detail so once i see the granular details i'll be happy to you know sir we will request on. more detail to snehansu and share it with you and connect over the email yeah. done done, done. Sir, thank you sir thank you sir thank you, sir. Thank sorry you, to take you. more of your time no no not no at all i think this is your forum you know this you should make the best use of this forum thank you sir yes and uh, maybe next question to dr uh, naik uh, May your thoughts on the digital interventions for the developmental disorders in children like autism, dyslexia, Jain, or yeah, Dr. Rajendra? Yeah. Dr. Vishu, I yeah. think Archita, to your question, I think look, all innovations are good, right? You've got to understand the need statement very clearly. You've got to understand your market segment very clearly. You've got to understand the profitability, the sustainability, and the scalability aspects very clearly, right? If there is an if there is an unmet need in the market. Uh, and if you have um, payers available for that that innovation, it will get lapped up, right? And so I think um, uh, I, I don't think it matters what individuals think about whether it is needed, whether it is not needed. Uh, I think what matters is do you see a market in it? Have you studied the market? Do you see payers in it? Have you, do you have an understanding with or partnerships with these payers themselves? And are you able to deliver on the need statement itself? Right? That's that's effectively what will translate into a good innovation itself. So I don't necessarily think the right question to ask is if this is the right area for the for the, for the intervention. Every area of healthcare is is ripe for intervention. Thank you very much, sir. And if my if I may add to what Dr. Arun has said, you know, is that as he rightly said, these are the areas where there is first a lack of awareness even. You know, and you have to understand with 6,000 psychiatrists and even, you know, the specialists are majorly into metro cities. The first thing that comes to you is, can you get the basics to pay their parents or their, you know, uh, providers, right? That's the first level of relief you get where they understand, oh, this could be dyslexia, this could be autism. And then once you get that, the second thing is you connect them to specialists because everyone may not have and it's very, uh, you know, difficult and problematic to even reach a facility to get care, getting an appointment. So there are multiple steps in the process before the treatment starts where you have an opportunity for digital intervention. There are multiple steps as you start the treatment where there are digital interventions and there are follow up stage where you need digital intervention. So you get three you know steps in the continuum of care and each of them as i said is a phd in itself in terms of digital interventions so as you as long as you get the patient journey right you can certainly find out solutions thank you very much sir uh, there is a general question so where we can get the support for regulatory related queries so just to share uh, there is a program called first hub where uh, Bayrak team connects with the regulators directly. This is uh, you know first come first serve basis. Please uh, Google it, and the Bayrak team will be very happy to help. And uh, many of the early stage innovators receive direct answers without any waiting on the same day, and some of them have gone to the next level as well. And uh, there is one more question regarding milestones. So this is uh, also again maybe uh, Sirsendu sir can add. Uh, so what are the milestones for each kind of projects? So I would say that you know, uh, for each uh, project, what you can achieve uh, with the given money and given time should be your milestone rather than uh, worrying about uh, what is the expectation. I think it should be like more about what you can achieve. Uh, with this, I would like to request uh, you know, Shirshendu sir and uh, Manish sir. I'll chip in here, uh, uh, Vishu. I think uh, the milestones are typically uh, in order to achieve the final goal of the project. For example, if you are looking at from ideation to POC, the milestones uh, could be aligned to whether or not you have achieved the POC. And the uh, overall project timeline is just about six to eight months. So the milestones will get distributed within that time. The solutions which are intending to get uh, field validated, of course, the milestones would be different and you have a longish uh, period to operate. And uh, once you are, uh, and similarly, the third category where you are looking at large scale deployment of the solution, uh, again, uh, those milestones would be accordingly different and the duration is also longish. Uh, once the fellow gets selected through the this national open call, the, the, uh, the experts, committee members, uh, they would also vet the milestones that you propose during the application, 
considering the time available, resources available, and award money. So it would be a more pragmatic kind of uh, 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 direction that, that you will get. The idea is that we need those many number of solutions uh, to be uh, facilitated and nurtured so that a larger goal of uh, digital health tech delivery can be can be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So, uh, Dr. Vishu, Dr. Nayak is, I think, online now. We had an earlier question for him, uh, his thoughts on digital intervention for development, developmental disorders in children, autism, dyslexia, et cetera. So maybe he can weigh in. Sir, Dr. Naik? Yeah, absolutely. I think this yeah. is an area <clears throat> which has uh, got a lot of potential. And some of you who might have uh, been following Shark Tank recently would also have seen some, uh, some innovations in this space. The, the key, however, here is to not only look at it from a medical point of view, but also from the social point of view, working with the families, caregivers, and finding the digital intervention. Uh, again, like I said, the medical part is a small piece, but the social part is even bigger. So working with them, I think there are, there are already few innovations which are happening here uh, in terms of learning, uh, quality of care, support, and things like that. But clearly anything which is, which is, uh, which involves children development, I think there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, areas that you can innovate. You know, just building on that, I think interventions focused on children, young adults, and elderly are ripe, right? Because there's very, uh, very, very little happening in the elder care, elder technology space. Uh, the younger population is going to be the single largest. A consumer of uh, technologies in the future and most of them will be digitally literate and they will be native to all these kind of technology interventions and i think as the gdp improves more people will be willing to adopt these technologies i think covid has really leveled that field so clearly there is an opportunity there so uh, i would highly encourage that you find the right clinical partners for this and also uh, some focus groups where uh, they can bring the lived experience uh, while you design this uh, product. Thank you very much, sir. And uh, we have uh, three more minutes and uh, one interesting question. And I would like uh, Dr. Anuya Jain to answer. Uh, I have a reason for this. Um, so can solutions that save drug wastage, can they be applied? The reason for you know requesting Dr. Anuya Jain is, you know, while taking Dr. Anuya Jain on Twitter, I realized that uh, when he went for a vaccine, we had to wait several hours despite of six people waiting there and you know can something be done i hope uh, it's okay sir to mention this please yeah yeah absolutely i think um, again from an eligibility perspective i think the gencare and biracting would need to answer whether they're eligible or not I, I don't necessarily know if drug products themselves are eligible to apply as far as uh, the Juncare Fund is concerned, I think this is looking more at mechanisms of delivery or follow-up as far as healthcare is concerned. Um, uh, however, sir, may I just add? So yeah, this is please. more about the platform to enable prevent wastage, not about the drug as such. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think I think there is a lot that is done, right? I, I'll give one example, right? Um, um, there is this physician couple that was there in Mumbai that during COVID-19 launched an entire innovation called Meds for More. Um, that essentially enable collection of drug waste um, or unused drugs and, and transition them uh, to people who really required them, right? Um, there was a very important lesson that we learned from that innovation. It really scaled up really high at one point of time. Um, uh, Mr. Bachchan and, and his family and a lot of celebrities essentially started backing that innovation, right? Um, the, uh, the important thing to remember is that don't go with a product as an answer, right? learn the problem first, think of the simplest solution to the problem first, understand if that really uh, addresses the problem, try to scale it and sustain it with digital innovations if required, right? Um, uh, many innovators make this, this, this issue of first developing the product and then trying to fit it to the problem itself, um, right? I think we live in a day and age when that is not necessarily the answer, right? You, you can look at 
potential solutions, whether they're in the digital world, whether they're in the non-digital world. And this is Met for More is a great um, uh, is a great answer to a problem right now. You could sustain it and scale it with digital interventions and introduce technology inside it in order to make sure that this can really spread uh, uh, to a larger base, right? Um, but but again, think about um, the the simplest way to address the problem first. Make sure that you've got your minimal viable product working, and then use digital technology in order to reduce the cost, scale it, and sustain. Thank you very much, sir. And we are at five o'clock. And uh, over to Manish. Thank you, sir. Um, first of all, thank you to all our eminent speaker who took their precious time today and. Uh, talked about the issue, gave us their perspectives and shared their experiences as, as, as well. I also thank all the partners uh, for the GenCare program and especially Bayrak for uh, leading us um, and all the participants, not the least, uh, who have... Manish, been... may I request you to share the next uh, week's uh, pro yes. program? And, so that, uh... Yes. And uh, as um, we mentioned, today was the second webinar in the series. The third C uh, webinar on this series will be on 18th of February on health data collection, predictive analysis, and digital learning in medicine. So please stay tuned. If you have not registered, please register. And um, on behalf of IKP, I thank everybody for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.